Good morning. Good morning. How was day one? Good. All right, cool. So I'm going to be talking about Node.js and containers and why they go so well together. But of course, when I named this talk, I had never been to Amsterdam before, so maybe we should actually call this fries and mayo, which apparently people love here. So my name is Ross Kukulinski. I'm a product manager at NodeSource. I'm also a member of the Node Evangelism Working Group. So I go to meetups and come to events and try to convince everybody that Node is the greatest thing in the world. Uh, I've also been working with containers for a long time. So I've been working and trying to figure out how to scale Node with containers and orchestration systems for a couple of years now. Uh, and I've got an introduction to CoreOS uh, video tutorial series by O'Reilly. So here's today's roadmap. So first of all, why Node and containers? Why are you in this room? What are we hoping to learn? Number two, we're going to dive into container orchestration. And then because I love to uh, threaten the demo gods, we're going to try to do a live demo today. OK, why Node and containers? Now, before we dive into the technical aspects, let's talk about business. Because at the end of the day, most of us here are working for companies, and companies like to make money. Businesses need to innovate faster. The quicker they can get a product out to market, the sooner they get feedback from users means that they can build better products and better services. And if you do that, you execute that, you profit. Your business is successful, you keep getting paid, you get to do it again next month. OK, great. Well, Node and containers accelerate innovation. I'm going to tell you why. Node and containers both excel in three key areas performance, packaging, and scalability. Well, let's dive into that. Now, from a performance perspective, there's a couple of ways you can analyze performance. Yeah, sure, there's technical performance. But let's talk about, from a business perspective, what's your most expensive aspect of your business? Your people. So if we can do anything to make our developers, our operations teams, be able to build faster, create and innovate new features and new capabilities faster, that means that as a business, we're accelerating our innovation. And Node does this, right? So we've got this Node as it's got this extensive package ecosystem. So developers become system integrators. You're pulling together bits and pieces of code to build larger applications faster. Also, it's fun. I love developing in Node. Happy developers are going to stick around. It also means that you can help retain your top talent and bring in new talent. So that's the people problem. What about technology? Well, Node helps solve the C10K problem. That's 10,000 concurrent connections. This was originally written in like the, the original thing was in 1998 or something when nobody, 10,000 connect, concurrent connections was like crazy. Now Node solves this problem. So Node can be inserted as your API gateway. If you want to roll out a new mobile application or a new website, it's going to be smashingly successful. But maybe your existing infrastructure was not built to handle all those connections. Node can be dropped in to handle that and offload that from your existing infrastructure. And then what we've seen is because developers enjoy building it and are faster building with Node, Node starts to pop up everywhere else in your infrastructure. Okay, so that's Node. How about containers? Well, containers have lower overhead. So compared to virtual machines, where you have an entire operating system, containers are just the application inside them. So that means your containers use less memory and less CPU. There's less overhead, which means that you can put more containers on your physical hosts, increase density, increase cost savings. It also enables developers to own the deployment cycle. And this is giving rise to this DevOps word, which means everything to everybody else. But at the end of the day, developers want to ship applications. They don't want to ship virtual machines. They don't want to ship AMIs. They want to take their application and just ship it. And a container is a nice, tight little box right around their application. So it enables those developers to ship that and own that whole cycle. Packaging. Node, again, has got this extensive uh, module ecosystem. And we have an explicit application dependency manifest. That's your package JSON. You explicitly say npm install dash dash save or dash s if you're fancy, all these dependencies. When you run your npm install, you're going to get a repeatable dependency installation. You're going to get those same packages again. So if you hand your Node app to somebody else and they npm install it, they're going to get the same stuff. When you tie that with containers, containers also have an explicit build manifest. That's your Docker file. It's a recipe. 
that describes exactly how to build this image. And once that image is built, it's immutable. You can't change it. If you change it, you are getting a new image. So because it's immutable, if I have this image and it's running in production, I can pull down that image and run it locally. It's the same code. And so if there's a, a problem with an application in production, that's fine. Maybe we remove it from rotation so it stops servicing traffic. I can pull that image down, and I can start to load test it locally and try to figure out why is it not working as it should. And that's running anywhere, whether it's on your development machine, in QA, in test, production, across multiple cloud providers. Scalability. This one I love. So Node scales at the process level, which makes it easy as a developer. You don't have to worry about thread locking and all this other you know, weirdness with uh, Java or C or some of these other languages that, that we've had to work with before. We write our Node app. It sits, and it's a single process. You need more scale. Run more of them. Done. Node is fast to boot. You run Node My App and a well-written Node app, it's up 10 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. It's fast. And we've already talked about the concurrency. So Node can handle those large number of connections that we're seeing in these new uh, cloud deployments and cloud applications. And then you pair that with containers. Containers also scale at the process level. You run, you run one process per container. And if you need more scale, you run more containers. They fit perfectly together like that. Containers are fast to boot. So if you have a fast Node app, a fast container, you can now scale up your application incredibly quickly. One of the other nice things about containers is that the scaling is not tied to your cloud provider. So if your current deployment process is, all right, we need to scale up. So we're going to ask Amazon or Google, give me 10 new virtual machines or 100 new virtual machines. How long is that going to take? If you already have some of that infrastructure ready to go with containers, you're just asking your orchestration system, give me 10 more. And you can also scale on a per process basis. So if your website shows up on Reddit or it's on Product Hunt and suddenly you get a ton of hits, you can scale up maybe your front end website, leaving your API servers alone, maybe leaving your databases alone. But if you are launching a new product and you're expecting lots and lots of signups, you're going to crank up your website and your API server that handles logins. That way, you can independently scale each aspect of your application as a whole. So containers in Node make developers and businesses happy. There's not a lot of things that do that. This is one of the reasons that I'm so excited working with Node in containers. OK. So Ross, you've convinced me. We're going to containerize all the things. Great. Now what? Well, if your architecture looks kind of like this, very simple client, might be mobile app, website, maybe you stick a load balancer, you've got a single tier of applications, you're in a database. It's a pretty simple three-tier web app. You can manage these containers using configuration management tools like Ansible, Puppet, Chef. Uh, you can use Docker Swarm uh, and Amazon's uh, ECS, or Elastic Container Service. But if you're like me and you tend to write more complex things the moment a customer asks for things, maybe your architecture looks kind of like that, with different teams using different languages and different services, and this team wants to use RethinkDB, and this team wants to use Mongo, and this team is over here is using Redis. We're going to need some orchestration help. How do we handle dealing with all of these independent moving pieces? And in a traditional deployment process, you probably have to write your own orchestration system. And Probably most of us, or some of us, probably have. I know I've written at least two or three of these. And I don't like writing orchestration systems. I want to focus on building a business value, building features and capabilities that are going to make my customers happy and pay us more so that I can do it again next month. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. So Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of your containerized applications. OK, so that's a mouthful. That's straight from the website. Let's talk about real talk. What does Kubernetes buy you? So Kubernetes schedules your containers onto the physical machines. So if you've got 100 machines, Kubernetes knows how much CPU memory is on each physical host. It knows what pods or containers it's already scheduled, how much memory and CPU they need. And it can figure out where to put them to make sure that loading is average and that we get uh, pretty good resource utilization. 
Kubernetes also does service discovery and load balancing. So you've got all of these applications back here, and there's all these interconnections. How do your apps find and talk to each other? Well, Kubernetes helps with that. It also does load balancing. So if you're working in, in any of the three main cloud providers, so AWS, Google, and Azure, uh, Kubernetes ties directly into their load balancers as a service. Kubernetes includes horizontal application scaling. So you can specify, hey, if my pods are above, if my containers for a certain application on average are above, let's say, 50% CPU, make more of them. Bring that average down, and we're able to make sure that we have a consistent latency profile, or whatever your key business metrics are. It also handles automated rollouts and rollbacks. And I'm actually going to demo this to you. So you can say, hey, I've got version one of my app. I want version two. But I don't want to just do a hard switch. I want to like, gradually roll it out, make sure everything is OK. I don't want to break things. So we have customers using this. And it also handles secret and configuration management. So when you build your image, or you build, whether you're building your application or building your Docker file, your image, you don't really want to inject secrets in there, like TLS keys, or maybe your database passwords, because that container is going to sit on a registry. It's the same reason we don't check in keys to GitHub. Don't check in keys into your Docker file. But you still have to have that somewhere. That needs to be accessible to your application. And Kubernetes provides a series of APIs to manage those uh, secrets and those configuration. And this is just a short list. Uh, I could spend days talking about Kubernetes. So that's enough of that. You want to see Kubernetes? Yeah. All right. So let's make sure we can all see this. All right, good. So it's all visible. OK, so Kubernetes, I have a, well, it's, I think I have a two node system. Yes. So Kubernetes has a CLI tool called Kubi Control that allows us to interact with the REST API. Now, all of this is secured by TLS and all sorts of nice things. So I feel safe running this even on conference Wi Fi. I also have VPN, so. Go me. Uh, and because I don't ever want to uh, battle the demo gods, I have a nice readme that's going to make sure that I don't uh, miss anything. OK, so let's look at our app first. Uh, so I have a very, very simple Node.js application. This app listens on a predefined port, or port 3000, and it's got three routes. It's got a health request, health Z. So if we hit that, we just say, yeah, sure, we're healthy. We probably should do a better health check. Number two, if we hit the URL slash version, we respond with the version that's in our package JSON. Finally, any other request, it's hello world, plain and simple. All right? So uh, we can run this. So here's our app, node index.js. And let's hit localhost 3000. That's a little small. Hello, world. All right. And uh, if we're lucky, I'm running version 1. Oh, and if I were lucky, I respond. Yeah, version 1. Now, I've already built uh, a Docker image for this, so we can take a look at the Docker file. Oh, it's... So um, this is a pretty standard Docker file for me. Uh, I've done other talks on like Docker file best practices. I've got a GitHub repo with some of this. Um, but basically, we copy our node app into the Docker file. We're using dumb init from the Yelp team to make sure that uh, we properly handle signals. And we run our app. That's it. Nothing fancy here. So with that, let's deploy our app. I've already built and pushed this image because I didn't want to consume con conference Wi-Fi. Uh, so let's roll this out. And let's make sure that I type this right. So we're going to use Kubi Control, and we're going to run. We're going to create a new application or what Kubernetes calls a deployment. And we're going to call this Hello World. And we specify our image. So my image is Ross Kuklinski slash Hello World. And I always tag my images so that I know exactly what that is. For those of you who maybe have worked with Docker before, when you build an image, if you don't specify a tag, the tag is latest. Don't ever use latest, because the next time someone pushes, guess what happens? Latest is no longer the latest you thought it was. So if you're going to build images, tag them with the version. Maybe it's from your package JSON. If you're using CI CD, use your Git SHA. Maybe a build, if you have unique build the numbers. That way, you can run, when you reference an image, it's always going to be the image that you expect it to be. 
we need to specify which port that Kubernetes should expose. So let's use port 3000. And we can specify the number of replicas. So let's start with three. We don't want to overload our system. And then I'll talk a little bit about labels later on, but we basically want to set our label is app equals hello world. Now, in a real world, you're probably not actually running commands like this. It's nice for demos. Kubernetes has API definition spec files. And it's either YAML or JSON. So that's how you actually handle this at scale or in, in a real environment. But this makes it easy for testing. All right. So we've created a deployment. Let's see what that looks like. So Kubernetes has this definition of what a pod is. A pod is basically a logical grouping of one or more containers that should reside on the same physical host. They should actually, their networking is shared, their file system is shared. In reality, most of the time when I'm working with Node, I just have one container. It's my Node app in that pod. Maybe if I need to have a cache, a local cache that's specific to that instance, then I might Redis, run Redis or some other memcache as a separate container in the same pod. In general, one pod per container one container per pod. Great. So they're running. That's cool. Now, I already went ahead and created a service. So Kubernetes has this definition of what a service is. And the service enables you, using that label, app equals hello world. And in fact, if we describe this service, we'll notice that the selector here what this service does is it looks at all of the pods that are running in the system. And any pod that has the label app equals hello world, if a request comes in to this external IP address, this is actually a Google load balancer IP address. So if you've got a computer, you can actually hit this IP address. If you hit it on port 80, it will send that traffic in a round robin fashion to any of the pods that have label app equals hello world. And so let's see that. So let's go back to here. So we hit that IP address, hello world. And we can just keep hitting it. Great. And we can look at the version. 1.0, right? Now, one of the things that when I first started working with Kubernetes that really blew my mind, because I had built an orchestration system that sort of did this, but it did in a terrible job, uh, Kubernetes does this in a very, very nice, elegant way. And that's rolling deploys. So you want to roll out a new version, and you want to roll it out one instance at a time, or groups of five, or groups of 10. And you want to have configuration of how fast and what sort of checks should be done. Kubernetes does that. So we're going to do a live edit of our deployment. Now, I have also pushed out a version two of my deployment. So let's go find the image here. So here's our container spec. Now, this is just a Kubernetes uh, API object that represents this deployment. We're just going to change version to two. When I save this, if we look at get pods, oh, that was fast. That was boring. It's much faster, nicer when it does it slow. You know what? We should just scale up. Scale, deployment, hello world. So now we're bringing up, because we're scaling, right? You know, we were on Reddit. You know, and actually, let's go one more. Let's just see if I can break something. OK, so we're bringing up a whole pile of pods. They're version two. Uh, we made a mistake. Let's undo Hello World. So we did a deploy, right? We're just going to undo that, back that back out. And as we start refreshing this, we'll see the 2.0 will start to flip to 1. And once all those pods are updated, it will all be 1. That's Kubernetes. That's containers. And this is awesome, right? And with that, thank you for your time this morning. <laughs>